Good morning, uh, everybody. Look at that outside. It is beautiful. It's warm. It's summer. I do have the air conditioning running. The audio on this seems to filter it out, so as long as I can get away with it. I do have this barn door open here, so um, it's not as cool as it could be in here. So anyhow, let's get into our subject. I try to teach about everything I can about the Bible, not just the end times. If I talked about the end times, you'd get bored. And I know that every time I put rapture in the title, I get more views than I will normally get. And we're just coming out of the doldrums of the filtering that YouTube does. So all my views were going down for a little while, all the stats were going down. We've bottomed out and we're starting to come back up. YouTube does it. I can't fight that if I'm going to stay on YouTube. I'm having trouble right now getting videos to upload to Rumble again. I know it's a free site, but they've got ads, so they have no excuse now for not making their program better. For the longest period, I could not upload with the, with the app phone, uh, the app on the phone. It wouldn't work. I could upload a one-minute video, but that was about it. So I had to take the file and transfer it over to my laptop, which took a while because I'm using a serial cable, and then I could upload it from the laptop using the browser app. That got to be time consuming, and it sometimes it would fail in the transfer. The app was working good for about two or three weeks, and it stopped again. It gets all the way done, and during processing, it locks up. So I'll keep trying, but Rumble is not a good replacement for YouTube. But YouTube's been around for a long time, and frankly, there's garbage on YouTube that shouldn't be watched by anybody, and that pay helps to pay for a lot of what they do. And you won't find that on Rumble. Okay, so today we're going to talk about blood. It's in all the movies, if you watch Dracula. I want your blood. Blah. <laughs> we all, we've always known that the blood was important, but they didn't know how. Sometimes when people would get sick in the olden days, they thought that the blood was carrying the problem, so they'd do bloodletting. They'd cut you and let you bleed out enough to get rid of the problem. The problem is diseases, although they may be carried by the blood, can inhabit any part of the body. So the problem is, is how do you get, get rid of it? Well, you got to figure out what's actually the problem and treat it. Getting rid of blood doesn't work. The human body has, on average, 10 quarts of blood. I think I'm close to 200 pounds, so maybe I've got 12 quarts. A baby has one. So there's a range, but an adult can lose four to five quarts of blood before they start seeing major, major problems. And I'm talking about a healthy adult. If you're in some other kind of a medical category, it's never good to lose things that are working. Okay, so Jesus died on a cross. His blood was spilt. Why? Well, let's continue talking about blood, and we're going to think about this blood from the point of view that it's not created by evolution. Just like our DNA, it's too complicated to randomly happen. Our blood's the same way. The blood is very complex. Now, in reality, your blood is clear. 
It's called plasma. My son goes twice a week and donates his plasma. They take it, they filter it, take all the stuff out of it that's important and put it back. They only want the liquid, the clear liquid part, because that's a generic blood. You can give plasma to anybody. When they ask you what your blood type is, you've got to give somebody the same blood type if you're going to give them whole blood. But if you don't have whole blood or they're AB negative or something crazy, you can give them plasma. Because you've got to have so many, uh, so much fluid in your in your system. So, what does the blood actually do in the body? Well, it's in charge of transportation. The reason your blood appears to be red is it's got red blood cells. The red is caused by iron. Iron deficiency, your blood looks anemic, yellowish. But the blood, when it's fully oxidated, is bright red. When the oxygen is depleted, it has kind of a bluish color. Because so, so there's two highways in the body, one going out and one coming back. Going out's bright red. So when you go to donate blood, that's what they take. And your body can replace it pretty quickly. When you go to donate blood, you donate a quart typically. Your body can replace that in a couple of days without any problem. I used to donate all the time, but I've kind of cut back. I don't mind doing it, except it's painful. My veins are small and they miss 70% of the time and I end up getting stabbed or they stick the needle in and they can't find the vein so then they're without pulling it back out just jabbing it around you know I'm not a pincushion uh, I've tried doing what my son does as far as donating plasma because they actually pay you for that I don't mind doing it for free but they actually pay you for that but my veins are too small so I can't do it I'm also too old, I have to get waivers from my doctors. Okay. So, as I've mentioned before, you can lose four to five pints. I said quarts. A pint is roughly a quart, but we'll get into the measurements later. Four to five pints of blood before your body starts to shut down. Whenever your body is in distress, it shuts down non-essential survival things. It's how the body stays alive. So it can shut down things that are not absolutely 100% necessary. It can't turn your heart off because that's 100% necessary. It really can't turn your brain off, but it can start turning off other parts. Okay, so what are the functions of blood? It carries oxygen and nutrients to the body's cells and tissues. It carries food. It's like our highway system, it's transportation. It also removes and carries out the carbon dioxide, dioxide and other waste products that are in the body. When the cells die, it carries some of that out. It also transports things to the liver and other parts of the body to filter. The liver is a basic, basic filter, like you have on your car, you got an air filter. You've got an oil filter. It can also absorb and distribute heat throughout the body. When it gets cold, your feet get cold, your hands get cold, the extremities, because it can't pump the heat as well to the extremities. If you're fighting an infection, it carries white blood cells and they're only produced as needed, but it carries them and antibiotics to the site of the infection. The body knows where the infection is and it sends stuff there. That's why it can swell up. It can, uh, you can see the infection. I won't get into what it looks like, but it's gross. And the body's got white blood cells in there to, to fight it. 
and there's different types of white blood cells depending on the type of germ that your body has been infected with. God inspired, remember? And the white blood cells themselves can actually produce antibodies. And they're a type of a protein that can attack very specifically the type of germ or bacteria that's in your system. It's also got a clotting aspect to it. So if there's a breach in the dam, it self-seals itself. Some people have problems with that. A lot of times after a major surgery, they put you on a blood thinner so that the blood clots that are already forming in your body because of it being opened up will dissipate and not get in and gum up something. This cannot be designed by random chance. All these functions are definitely not a product of evolution. So, let's see what the Bible says. Let's go back to the law. Leviticus 17.11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for your souls upon the altar. For it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. We know because they sacrificed animals and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat on the ark once a year day of atonement only the high priest could do that it's as close as you can get to god on earth leviticus 17 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you we just read that didn't i yeah i did well there's supposed to be another verse here Supposed to be 17, I think, 23. What happened to it? Okay, I don't know. I must have not, not copied it in. All right. Um, there's some more in Leviticus about the importance of blood. So let's move on to Deuteronomy 12:16, which you must not eat the blood, pour it on the ground. Get rid of it. You could eat the flesh, but not the blood. I don't know why. The blood might have things that would be bad for you to eat. It's got stuff unique to that critter that you just killed. The calf or the cow or the sheep, whatever. In my case, uh, deer. I would go with my dad deer hunting as a kid. We'd find a deer, he'd shoot it, or I'd shoot it. Most of the time it was him. You gut the deer, which is standard for anything when you kill it, and then you hang it and let the blood drip out. After that's done, then you transport it. Got to get the blood out. I don't know how much you guys are into Shakespeare, but one of his books is called, the uh, stories is called The Merchant of Venice. In The Merchant of Venice, blood is a reoccurring theme that appears in many places, especially during the conflicts between people of different races and religion. Shakespeare was one that liked to point how stupid it was for them to have reasons of these divisions. It's Satan. Shakespeare's good reading, sometimes hard reading, but it's good reading. And he deals with pretty much every problem that you can imagine. So the play, the, the play explores the connections between blood and faith and between the racial and religious identity. The, play, the plays, uh, I'm reading from a little quick article I copied down, so I'm not, I, I know The Merchant of Venice, I read it a number of times but I can't remember, so I have to rely on other people's comments. The play's central conflict is Shylock's bond with Antonio, which would allow Shylock to take a pound of Antonio's flesh. You won a court deal where you could do that. But when Portia, disguised as a male lawyer, 
points out that the contract only states that Shylock can remove flesh, but not blood. Shylock's plan is foiled. If Shylock were to shed any blood, the Venetian law would forfeit his lands and goods. Clever writing, but to the point. You can have the flesh, not the blood. You wanted a pound of flesh. You've heard that term. Virgin of Venice. Now, the Old Testament sacrifices were temporary. Every year, the high priest would sacrifice something, sprinkle the blood, and that was a covering to hide the sin from God, because God can't look on sin. So in order for God's chosen people to be able to be in association with God, they had to cover their sin once a year. There were other things, other laws that said if you did something during the other times of the year, you would take something to the priest, he would kill it and sacrifice it on the altar. It was, it was basically like saying, you know, say three Hail Marys and call me in the morning. Uh, it had the same effect. So Jesus' blood removes the sin with his blood sacrifice. It's gone forever. When you confess your sins and accept Jesus Christ, your sins are gone forever. Does that mean you never sin again? No, but it means it's already been paid for. So you don't have to sacrifice anything ever again, one sacrifice for all, for eternity. Now, does that mean you don't have to think about God or Jesus again? No. Every time you sin, you give that to Jesus. And he throws it away. And you get back out there and you do what you're supposed to do. Now, again, we know about the blood. In medicine, again, when someone dies, they choose to preserve the body by removing the blood and then filling the veins with a chemical, basically, formaldehyde and some other chemicals. Things that will not sustain the body, but will hold it together, keep it plumped up. Uh, I'm trying not to get too graphic on this, so it's not too gross. Um, I don't know of anybody seen dead bodies. I've been to two funerals where I've seen the body, and I chose never to do that again. Now, the first one was a friend of mine when I was working out in California. His father died. And they had a nice, elaborate funeral, open casket. And his father looked nice in the casket. He looked live because they used makeup. They had him, we, we get embalmed when you want your body to, to last. And he looked nice. But I saw my father, who didn't have a good embalming, they basically just left him. And he looked hollowed out because it had all been drained out of him. And I chose not to see my mother when she passed, because I, did, I want to remember people with good images. I'm lucky enough to remember it all. I don't want to put a bad image in that I can't get rid of. So the embalming fluid is formaldehyde, methanol, ethanol. So basically, they fill it full of a, a, essentially a solvent. And they started doing this back in the Civil War. The soldiers were a long way from home, and when they died, they wanted to get the body home. They didn't have refrigeration. Bodies don't last long in the southern heat down here. It feels like it's over 100. I don't know what the temperature is. They don't last long, so they started putting things in the veins to extend the body's life. The body. Spirit's already gone. But they needed the body to stay alive so they could get it home to the family. That was a good gesture on the doctor's parts. Okay, what else we got? Matthew 26, 27. You're familiar with the Last Supper. And he took the cup, gave thanks, 
and gave it to them, said, drink from it, all of you, symbolically. It's not blood. It could probably have been wine. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for as many, or is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's the reason for it. We do this when we go to church and put the tablet on our tongue or a little cracker and drink the little cup of wine. We're remembering this. We're reenacting this. Again, it's not real blood and it's not real flesh. Symbolically, we are doing this in remembrance of him. I tell you, and this is Galilean. So these Galileans understood this, that in a marriage proposal, when they drink the cup to be engaged, which is essentially marriage, he will say, I will not drink from this until I return from my father's house, where he goes to build a room onto his father's house. Jesus has been doing that for a long time. This thing's going to be very smart and stylish when we get to move into our new digs, huh? I tell you, why not drink of uh, the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So, there's no need to spill blood anymore. Jesus already did. And to remind us of his covenant, we take the offerings a few times a year. It depends on the church. It's symbolic. It helps us to remember. I don't drink anymore because my body doesn't tolerate it. But the last things that I'd like to drink were wine. I'm originally from California. They've got very good wines out there. And there was a winery that I would get wines. I was in the Wine of the Month Club. No, I don't drink so much that I get drunk. That's not what wine's for. It's for taste. It complements a meal. You get your wine type based on what your meal is. Red meat, red wine, essentially. Fish, some kind of a, a clear wine. Typically, a, well, it depends on the fish, but it, a Chardonnay or a Pinot Noir would be for fish and chicken. So it complements it. And you don't sit there with, you know, not everybody gets a bottle. There's a, you open the bottle, you let it air out for a little bit, and then you go around and fill up the wine glasses, and you have that with your meal. In Jesus' time, they all, everyone in the family drank wine, even the children. But it wasn't, you know, 120 proof wine. Most of the time it had, you know, maybe a half a cup per gallon of wine in, in the water. It killed the path pathogens, so it did add some flavor, but it killed the pathogens, which is why they used it. Now you could make good wine, just like we have today, and Jesus knew how to do that because he did that when he turned the water into wine. Okay. So the bottom line is, the blood is important. And what Jesus did in his sacrifice, he fulfilled the law. He completed the law. The law of sacrifice that we have in the Old Testament from Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, Numbers. They had all these rituals and he satisfied all of them. That's why he had to be without blemish. You have to sacrifice a pure lamb. They raised lambs specifically for the temple sacrifice. That's what the shepherds were doing up on the hill when Jesus was born. They were raising the temple lambs. Jesus was born in a manger with swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes would have been used to wrap a lamb for the temple. When they told them where to find him, they knew exactly where to go. That was their home when they weren't up on the fields. 
it all ties together. Only God could do that. So the next time you take your sacraments, remember Jesus died, spilled his blood for all of us so that we never have to worry about sin again as far as separating us from God. Even down here in this physical separation, we're not really separated from God. We have the Spirit living in us. No other religion has that. He's your comforter, as Jesus said. Go and wait in Jerusalem and I'll send the comforter. But he's also blowing the trumpet for you, encouraging you, teaching you. And there's only two things you can do that stop him from doing that. Sinning. And I'm not exactly sure the full definition of the, of the two or where the line's drawn, but you can grieve the Holy Spirit and you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can dilute it. And I think that has to do with the severity of your sin. So don't do that. Or if you find that you are, stop, repent, ask for forgiveness, and get back on the horse. We can do that. No other religion can do that. All right, until we meet in the clouds, God bless.